Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. Forgive us in our little handoff shuffling of the uh, electrical equipment. So glad to um, be with you guys to actually share communion and to remember the thing that we have in common, this union in Christ Jesus. Before we get started, let's just pray. Father, this morning we simply lift our hearts before you. And Lord, we recognize that you have done a tremendous work by coming and dying for our sins, by putting your Holy Spirit within us and making us your own. And yet, Lord, the work is not finished. There's so much change. There's so much more that we have yet to do for you that this is the beginning of this great unfolding of your plan for our lives. I pray that you might work in our minds and hearts this morning by your word and by your spirit that we might be more molded to your image, that we might present to the, word, the, the world a truer image of you. And Lord, you know the secrets of each one of our hearts and you know the things we struggle with. I pray that you might help us. Feed us by your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are in the little teeny book of 3 John. 3 John, of course, coming after 2 John and after 1 John. It's a direct letter to a guy named Gaius. So uh, Gaius being a very familiar term or a familiar name back then, it could be one of many Gaiuses, but we're going to look at this. And what I've titled it is, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. How many of you know what I mean? But there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Uh, I can pull up on my computer pictures of Mount Everest and people hiking up there and those who didn't quite make it and they, their bodies are still up there actually freeze dried on the side of the path. There's a difference between looking at a picture online and actually being there. And very often with Christianity, we take a lot of pride in, uh, at least many of us take a lot of pride in understanding the path and being able to explain it. And yet there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And I think one of the dangers, I think, of Christianity is that we forget about that. You think because you know something, therefore you must be doing it because you know it. But that isn't always the case. Uh, actually, I, I pulled that quote from uh, the prophet Morpheus. So uh, to, to follow with Mark's line of prophetic utterance. So we're going to see three guys. There's Gaius, there's Diotrephes, and there's Demetrius. So these, these three men are featured in this letter, and you're going to see that these three personas are basically the structure of the letter as John writes it. So going to the first slide, if I turn this thing on, it actually will probably work. Or maybe it won't. Oh, there it is. Beginning in 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, who I love in the truth, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in the manner worthy of God, you do well. You will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, 
prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. And beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So that's how it concludes 3rd John in the very end. And you'll notice it's very much like 2nd John. He says very much the same thing. And the uh, understanding is that they were sent at the same time to two different, one is the elect lady who we talked about last week. And the other is uh, this, this guy Gaius. To the elder, uh, this is what I imagine Gaius looks like. Just so you could put a face on him. You can call him Guy, he doesn't mind. To, and, and the elder is John himself, and we saw him that he wrote this previously in Second John. He called himself only the elder. And I actually looked into why he does this, because uh, he always refers to himself in the third person or in some kind of surreptitious way. You have to imagine at the time when there's severe persecution and they're actually killing disciples and killing believers in Jesus Christ, when you write a letter like this, you don't necessarily tell people overtly who you are. And so he says, the elder, and they know who he means, and so we know who he means. But if somebody were to grab a hold of this letter, it would be a hard thing to try to pin it on John or to try to find his origins. So I think that's probably why he just calls himself the elder, and so we know him. And then Gaius is, he could be one of four Gaiuses in the Bible. It's kind of a common name like George. You know, hey, George, and you're writing a letter to George. Could be any number of Georges. And so Gaius isn't a particular person that we have a lot of information about. But uh, the, the content of what he says, I think, is important. So that's what we're going to focus on. This greeting, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Well, that, that just sounds like a lot of prosperity gospel right there. In fact, there are people that take this verse and take this as a promise, and they say, you see? We can pray. They, they think that this is a big prayer that he's praying out for Gaius that he might be in health and that he might prosper even as his soul prospers. But actually, this was a very common greeting of the day. Like uh, the, the, the greeting that we say sometimes is, what's up? Or good morning. If you analyze any one of those greetings, you can get a little fastidious about it. Like, is it really a good morning? Is it a good morning for you? Are you having a good morning? Because I'm not having a good morning, so I don't know what you're talking about. Or, or, or you say, hey, what's up? And so we have these sayings that are very common, and we use them, or, or, or just hey. I say hey because I'm just so conflicted about analyzing all these things. I just say, hey. <laughs> because I don't have to overthink that. That's just an utterance. So. It was a common greeting of the day, just so that you know, and, and we have all sorts of ways that we greet one another. Of course, with masks and COVID, uh, there's always this, hi. Am I giving a fist pump? Am I, you know, am I gonna shake hands? Are we actually gonna make contact? Is, you know, are we just gonna, are we gonna, whenever you see this, you get the idea that you're, 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 you're approaching something and there, this impending doom has come upon someone, so you just back off. But we have all of these greetings and some of them just don't mean much and, and it's much more of a cultural thing. Uh, there are people in other countries that when they greet one another, they kiss. I don't know if they do that with a mask on now, but there are all sorts of different ways that we greet each other and what does that really show, a greeting? It, it shows how you feel about somebody else. And I think, how important is that? 
You know, to see people that you haven't seen for a long time or to see people that you've been thinking about and praying about and you finally lay eyes on them, you get an opportunity to express your love towards them and to let them know that you've been thinking about them and that you care about them and that they're valuable and that they would be missed if they weren't in your life. And I've just been awakened to this fact that greeting is hugely important. It's not just, hey, how you doing? Good morning. Hey, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I throw a whole bunch of other letters together. And it's meaningful, and it should be an expression of your love towards somebody. And so whether it's a hug or a handshake or a, uh, it, but there's a, a look in the eye, you know, where you're, you're looking beyond the windows of, of the soul, the eyes, and you're looking into someone, and you actually see them as who they are. I think it's incredibly important. So I've been meditating on this, so forgive my rant. Uh, but this is the guy I want to be. <laughs> hey! You know, and you see that guy coming toward you, and you're like, oh, I hope we don't have COVID. You know. <laughs> People and the expression of love, I think, are so much more important, aren't they? So that's why I don't care. If you're coming up to me like that, you're getting a hug, and I'm going to hug you well. I'm going I'm to make sure you remember it. So greetings, I think, are very, very important. And uh, it's really quite important. And I think we've trivialized it and made it some kind of a, you know, oh, here comes somebody. Oh, we've made eye contact. I have to say something, you know, as opposed to a real expression of your love and concern and the love of Jesus Christ for that person that you carry. What a tremendous privilege that is. What an incredible weight when you think about it. A greeting, how important that is. Of course, you don't want to over-greet people. You want to make sure you greet them in a level that they can handle. So the scriptures, I, I thought it only said in one place, but I was surprised to find out. It says in Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. In 1 Corinthians 16, 20, all the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. In 2 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. You're getting it. Yes, in 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, wow. The scriptures are full of, you should be, planting one on each other. <laughs> now, I think it's much more of a cultural thing there, but notice the quality of such a thing. It's a kiss of love, you see? And I think that's the important thing. It's a communication. It's a, you know, body language is a huge form of communication. And I think a greeting is a part of it, and I think we just have turned it into some kind of a trivial thing. So uh, that's why I'm in my head about it. So. This greeting, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Well, this was, a very, uh, this was a very common thing of the day to say that to someone. I pray that you might be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. It, it sounds like a wonderful promise and a wonderful prayer until you think, well, what's the condition of my soul? If my soul's not in good shape, I don't want to be healthy and prosperous like my soul is because my soul's not in good shape. I'd rather be more prosperous and more healthy than my soul because there's stuff on my heart. You know, I'm burdened by things. I'm, I'm worried about things. I'm concerned about things. I don't, if, if some of us were as prosperous and as healthy as our souls, what would we look like? Oh, I pray that you might be healthy and prosper even as your soul prospers. Whoa, don't, don't pray that for me, brother. You know, I, I'm burdened. I got trouble. I got problems. And, but so would you look like some homeless guy, you know, clutching his cat and his whiskey uh, if, if that were the case, if you were on the outside looking like what's going on in the inside, you know, or would you be like a, a well-dressed man, you know, uh, with, the, with the outside? Uh, there's, there's Howie, by the way. That's very amazing. <laughs> This is just a few years ago. But if, if you're going to pray that, make sure that somebody's soul's in good shape because otherwise you, you don't know what you're going to get on the outside. 
So it's a, it was a common phrase. Actually, they used to use an acronym. They, instead of putting it in the letters and writing it all out, they would just write out the acronyms. You know, like you guys do when you text, you young people do when you text? I'm an old people, I don't do that. I, I actually have to spell it out, or I'm, I'm usually talking into my phone because I'm not a good texter. But you know, the, the whole LOL, SYL, you know, like there's all of these abbreviations that people go crazy with. Well, that's what they would do with this greeting. So, uh, and, and it, they did it in Latin as well. And I, I was gonna pull it up for you and show you this historical thing and you would go away with some trivial knowledge, but I didn't do it. So, verse three, for I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. And I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He's talking about this great reputation that Gaius had in, in the church of what a wonderful man he was and how he was living the truth. And he says, there were some folk that went and visited your church and they came back to me and I'm so glad to hear that you're doing the right stuff. You're being like Jesus Christ. You're treating people well and you're loving. And I think, my goodness, bad news travels fast, but so does good news, right? Good news travels fast too. So it's not just bad news that travels fast. And so when, when we do acts of love, and sometimes they're random, and we see people, we don't know the far-reaching impact of that. We don't know when people leave here, what, if they're a guest, what sort of love it is that they experienced here and how that affects them when they go. Or if you see somebody in work and you really care for them, you really love on them, you greet them well, and you're concerned for their soul, and you do wish that they would be healthy and prosper even as your soul prospers maybe. That makes an impact on somebody. And I just wonder, here's, here's this guy who entertained some folks who came to his church, and they went back to John, and they, they talked about him. But they talked good about him because he was doing all the right things. Believing the truth means that you're walking in the truth. And that's the way it should be. If there are things that we understand mentally, they should be things that we're working out in our, in our lives, not just our words. You know, God bless you. You know, you could say that to somebody and then do absolutely nothing for them in, in the way of help. So we don't want to do that. And James says here in chapter 2, if you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which we all would agree that that's a tenet of the Christian faith, you do well. But if you show partiality uh, or prejudice, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he has not works? Can faith save him or can that kind of faith save him? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And dead faith is worthless. But someone will say, if you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works. See, it's a ridiculous question. That's sarcasm, by the way, in the Bible. And I will show you my faith by my works. You know, if somebody says, oh, I believe, I believe. Oh, yeah, well, I don't see it. So I'll tell you what. I'll show you what I believe by what I do. You tell me what you believe without that. You can't. Because what you really believe is what you do. It's not about knowing. It's about occupying. It's about doing. It's about acting on what you know. And then you really know it. You don't know something just because it's mentally stored away. Verse 5, beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. So for these folks that came, these traveling missionaries, if you will, they were preaching the gospel on behalf of John being sent out, and they came to this church to see how they were doing. They were received well by Gaius, and they were put up and uh, you know, they entertain them. Hospitality, by the way, is not about entertaining people uh, or even coffee and donuts. Hospitality is about loving a stranger. That's actually the, the word means philo, which is the word for brotherly love, and then xenos, which is uh, the, the word for outsider. So it's a, a lover of strangers, a lover of an outsider. And Gaius just took these people in and fed them and cared for them, let them stay in their house, and that's hospitality. And it used to be that hospitals were called hospitals because that's what they did. 
they took people in and they were caring for strangers. And whether you had insurance or not was not really that big a deal. They would service you and make sure that you got taken care of. Now they're called medical centers because they don't practice hospitality. You have to have insurance. So, so he says, 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, more of it is required of stewards that won't be found faithful. The first thing that he says about Gaius is you've been faithful. You're doing the right thing. Being faithful is, is continuing to do the right thing regardless of outside pressure or other people's opinions or what they might say. You do that which you know is right before God. And he says, if you send them on in a manner worthy of God, you, you will do well. It's interesting. We're told to treat people as though they were Jesus Christ. It says, wives, submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. It, it means as if he were Jesus Christ himself. The wives didn't understand that before I just said it, right? Or maybe you don't believe it yet. But it says that we should treat one another like this person is from God or this person's an angel. If they were an angel or a dignitary, you would treat them a bit differently than you would people that you're used to being with, right? And I think what we do, then Abraham did that once. Abraham did that once. So we want to... Make sure we treat people well. In Hebrews 13, 2, it says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. The scripture says, when you treat people who are strangers in a nice way, you don't know who those strangers are. Abraham saw three visitors. They came up, and uh, two, at least two of them were angels. He didn't know they were angels. It says that he ran to them. And he implored them to come in. And he immediately went and killed one of his live animals and, and got it going and made some food. And then he served them a non-kosher meal, which I think is significant. But anyway, I digress. Be careful how you treat people, because, especially strangers, because you don't know who they are or where they're going. It also says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So everything that we do, we really are doing for an audience of one. We don't do it for other people. We don't do it to be seen of them or appreciated or a thank you. And if you do, you'll be extremely disappointed because people just don't do that much. But certainly not here. And in Colossians 3:23 to 25, it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily. In other words, with all your heart. You, you give it your best effort. As to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive your reward for the inheritance. For you, receive, uh, for you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. You see, God's, God's not playing favorites. He rewards everybody evenly according to their behavior, uh, including Gaius and including the guy who's going to be talked about next. Second John is a book that limits hospitality. If you remember to this elect lady, he says, be careful who you take into your house because you're kind of authorizing their ministry. Here, they're being encouraged to show hospitality to the right people and to make sure that you receive them. So that's the difference between second and third John. One is more limiting hospitality and the other one kind of opens it up. Verse seven, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. So they had these traveling missionaries that came into their church and they received them and they became partners in what they're doing. You know, when you support a mission or a missionary, you actually become part of the work of what they do. I don't know about you, but that's kind of a neat thing. So you don't want to be partners with the wrong people. You want to be partners with the right people. And so when you partner with them, when, when you guys give to this church and you support this church, you support everything this church does. You support me and my voracious appetite. <laughs> you support my wife and you support everything that we do. You guys are a partaker with everything that happens here. You have stock, if you will, in Grace Bible Fellowship. You, are, you have a, 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 an interest. You have some skin in the game, as they say. And that's what happens when we get involved in people's lives. And he's talking about these missionaries that came. Church is definitely this group effort. It's no, no effort of one person. Beware of large nets accepting donations from everyone. You know, it's, uh, he says they didn't take anything from the Gentiles. That means the unbelievers. These traveling missionaries would not take anything from the unbelievers. 
They, you know, there, there might be well-wishing unbelievers that say, hey, listen, I'd like to invest, you know. You want to be really careful about accepting favors from somebody or accepting money from the government. Well, I got a little noise out of the group for that. Okay. <laughs> because there are always strings attached. I, I always wonder what's going to happen with all these COVID things where businesses have taken money from the government and they haven't quite written the script of how it's going to get paid back yet. Uh, I, I don't know how that's going to go, but I pray that you're not tied up into that. Anyway, beware of large nets accepting donations from anyone. Supporting ministers, ministries are ministers. Every one of us is a minister. Not, it's not just a title given to me or anyone else. It, we're all ministers because we all serve in some capacity in the ministry. And you don't have to be the one on the stage singing or playing or leading worship or preaching. You're a minister and you're part of that. As much as anybody else, you're a team member. So just know that. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, there was uh, David was planning a raid on some of these bad guys, and he left half the people here, and he sent the other half of the people out. And the guys that stayed back to kind of watch the equipment and guard the, the women, children, and the flocks and the stuff, when, when the raiding party came back with all the goods that they get from that, they were told to share with the people that stayed behind. And the people that went out said, listen, we risked our lives. We went out and fought. We're not going to give half of our stuff to these people. And David said, no, 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 you don't get it. We're a team. We're a team. We all share everything in common. And these guys stayed back, watched your wives, your kids, your flocks, and, and all your stuff, and none of it disappeared. So you, you don't see that as valuable? You see, David understood everybody's important on the team, not just the guys at the front line, but all of the people and the support people that are back behind. So I want to give a big thank you to all of you guys to be supporters. And if you think, well, you know, I really don't do anything, well, you're a supporter, and you support this work. And I, I praise God for that. I want to tell you I'm thankful. Church is a team effort. Hey, did you notice how clean everything is in here? There's a group of people that do that. Did you notice all those little cups were put out? People cleaning up and... You had a couple of guys, a couple of different guys up here reading the scriptures to you and exhorting you in Christ. You see there are people back there running the, the, the film ministry or the, the, the digital ministry back there and music ministry. There are so many hands that make this work. And um, don't undervalue the importance of support people. Hugely important. We couldn't do what we do here if it wasn't for all of them. Hospitality should always be found liberally and habitually in the body of Christ. It's something that should characterize a Christian life. Amen? Amen. So we seek to do that. And uh, we're promised that the more we give away, the more the Lord will give us anyway. So I like to give it away. You know, especially if it's old. I like to give No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I used to keep every old thing. I used to keep old hammers that would only half work, you know, hammerheads coming off, you know, I'd, I'd repair them and, you know, fix them up and, you know, I'd have put duct tape and all of that because duct tape's good for everything. But then I realized I'm shortchanging myself. If I don't wear something out, I don't have the right to go get a new one. So now I don't mind. I don't mind throwing things away because then, you know, I mean, I, you know, anyway, sorry. I, was, I didn't want to confess to you, but there was. Verse 9, I wrote to the church... But Diotrephes, everybody go, ooh. Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Can you imagine the gall of a guy in a church, a disciple of John, or, or at least somebody who's running the church, the parent, he rejects John's apostleship. And John's writing to him, and he's like tearing up his letters and rejecting him, and... He says, this guy loves to be first. He has to be the most important person, the smartest guy in the room. Uh, this Diotrephes, and he's in the church, and it, apparently he runs the place. Holy mackerel. You know why people take things into their own hands sometimes? It's because they get fed up. John is very gracious in here. But notice he names his name. And forever it's in the scriptures. So I, I always think of him like Blackbeard the pirate, you know, running the church. I hope none of you think I'm like that. But anyway, <laughs> the, the dude has heart disease, okay? I mean, his heart is in a really bad place. 
he feels he needs to be the most important person. And you find these people, they tend to rise to levels of authority, uh, not only in the church, but also in the business world. And they tend to treat people very malignantly. Uh, it's not a good deal. So he's got some heart disease. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, one of the characteristics of love is that love does not seek its own. It's not self-centered. It's not about you. Love is something that you give away, and it's about other people. And Diotrephes seem to have a problem. Desiring to be first is definitely not what a servant is. In Acts 20, verses 29 to 30, there was a warning that Paul actually gave to the church. He says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, within the church, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, and he says, this is what's going to happen. When I leave, there'll be outside forces coming in. There'll be inside forces trying to subvert and take charge. He says, make sure you have your eyes open for this. And he wept. It says that he wept on their necks as he left because he was so concerned for their souls. So they were warned that people like this would happen. So it's no surprise. In Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, we're given the seven things that the Lord hates. You guys know that the Lord hates certain things? It's, it, it's kind of a, it's an exercise for me. It's, it's the eyes, it's the mouth, it's the heart, it's the feet, it's the mouth again. And then the last one, and anyone who sows discord among brethren. So it's, it's a proud look. It's a lying tongue. It's hands that shed innocent blood. It's a heart that devises wicked schemes. It's feet that run into sin, that run quickly to evil. A false witness that pours out lies, and a brother or a person who stirs up dissension among brothers. Those are the things that God hates. So this guy is on one of, one of the Lord's most hated lists. So not somebody you want to be is on that list. In verse 10, therefore... John speaking about this man. If I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does. So he wasn't about non-confrontationalism. Prating against us with malicious words and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren. And he forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So this guy is so angry that he badmouths John, the apostle as though there's anything you can badmouth him about. He's just so meek and mild. But he prats about him, which is to be a babbler or a trifler, to berate idly or mischievously. So he spoke gossip, and he talked him down. He shot off his mouth he, about John, the apostle, who was away busy. And, I, I, you know, and then there were people that were coming to the church, these traveling um, missionaries, and he wouldn't receive them into the church. And anybody in the church that would receive them, he kicked them out of the church, said, no, nope, you're not coming to church here anymore. You let those people in your house. Can you believe that? I don't know about you. I feel like I want to find this guy. But anyway. <laughs> you know, there are people that think loyalty can be extracted from people when you use various powers of manipulation. And it's just silly. Uh, that, that's not at all what the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to do. He was what we might call a control freak. He shot his mouth off. He was a gossip. Uh, so there are many things that he did that were not right. He was a talebearer. And a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. The scripture teaches us that we should just keep our mouths shut more often than not and be good listeners instead of uh, hearty talkers about everybody else's business, Right? You ever been talked about? And then you hear about it from somebody? I hate that. So don't, don't do that about me. I hate that. So <laughs> it was said of Satan. It was said of the Pharisees. It was said of the atrophies. Let it never be said of you that you're a person who prats, maliciously goes on and just talks somebody else down, tears down their character and just stands in in, in the way of progress, and certainly this is good godly ministry. Uh, so it's not even just normal life. So this guy's a bad egg. Verse 11, 
Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. That sounds awfully judgmental of John. Oh, that's in the scriptures. If somebody does evil and that's their character and that's who they are, they've never seen God. How'd this guy get in a position of authority in the church? I don't know. Anyway, you know those people. It's all about me. It's about mine. It's my birthday. This is my cake. You can't have any. They forget that the church is not theirs. They, they think the church is theirs, and it's not the Lord Jesus Christ who's the shepherd. And we can get that way about our stuff, and we can get that way about things, too. And so we should never be that way. We should hold everything with an open hand because it was the Lord who gave it to us, right? I mean, even this facility, even our stuff, we should be willing to have an open hand, and we should be willing to practice hospitality. So... In John 3.30, John the Baptist, the baptizer, says this wonderful thing. He must increase and I must decrease, speaking of Jesus. And it's really about furthering his kingdom and that your life really isn't about you at all. It's about the Lord. And sometimes we think our life is about us, but that's a fallacy. Because our life will be over in an instant, like, like a mist that appears for a moment and then is gone. So if your life is about you, you don't, you, you don't have much time. And eternity is a long, long, long time. So in Matthew 18, the disciples even came to Jesus and they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The disciples were arguing about who is the greatest. Can you imagine that? So, all right, let's have an arm wrestling contest. We'll figure out who's the best. Because that's the ultimate way to see who God loves, right? <laughs> Even they had these arguments. And Jesus says some very strong things to them. And Jesus called a little child to him, and he set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, you guys need to be converted, you disciples. And become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say you have to have the faith of a child. He says you need to be converted and become like a child, which means that you're completely dependent. You have no authority. You don't boss people around, tell them what to do. You become a child who's dependent, who asks questions, who's always interested in learning because they don't know everything. And they ask silly questions, but they're questions that they need answers to. And so we kind of humor them and make sure we give them good answers, right? Just, just agree with me. That's exactly what you should do because they're children. You know, you... I, I have grandchildren that live with me, and they do the silliest things. You get a flower that just begins to come up, and they go, oh, and they go, and they tear all the petals off of it. And they make a fairy potion for fairies that don't exist. And then it's left outside, and then I have to clean it up. And, you know, it's, they're worse than deer, I'm telling you. But they're children. They're children, and so you're like, that's cute, that's cool, you know? And you explain to them, and you give them explanation, and, you know, you're patient. And in the midst of all that, I'm saying, why do I feel like such an old man? When did I become this grumpy, eh, stop touching my flowers, you know? But because they're children, you have compassion on them, because they're children, you know? And they don't know any better until you tell them 50 times, and then you expect they would. But Jesus said, listen, you need to become like a child. You, you just have to be dependent upon the Lord. And that's the best heart, isn't it? To find somebody that, you know, you ask them, hey, listen, could you do something for me? And they go, you know what? Would you mind if I just ask the Lord first before I say yes? Oh, I so appreciate that. That's like the fragrance of Jesus. To be dependent upon the Lord for an answer instead of giving a readily answered you know, all right, yeah, sure, no problem, yeah, and then you're not able to do it. I, I'm confessing. Sometimes I do that. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one of these little children or a little child like this, in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to, that believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck than he would drown in the depth of the sea. Do you see how Jesus says, you need to be like a little child and you got to know that I have their back. 
So if you take one of these little ones of mine and you, you seek to cause them to sin, you're in deep trouble. It's better you get a big stone tied around your neck and thrown in the ocean. I don't know what that's like, but I, I, you know, I don't want to see what's worse than that. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man from whom the offense comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it's better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Jesus makes a really good point. And all of this is in the context of who's the greatest? A little child is the greatest. And you better be careful how you treat somebody like that in the kingdom of God because they're the greatest, which me and not Muhammad Ali. It's those people, the humble of heart, that Jesus has their back. So don't ever try to take advantage of them because the Lord, the Lord will get you. So, are you a servant? Uh, I have to ask myself that question. Am I really, truly a servant? And, and I'm supposed to be the servant of all, the scripture says. I should be the biggest, hardest, um, most joyful servant of everyone because I'm a pastor. It doesn't say, you know, I should have a special place right in the front where I park my Mercedes. None of that mess. That's not scriptural. I should be the biggest servant in this place. And so I have to ask my question, am I, am I a servant or am I like the atrophies and I'm all about my own authority and trying to control people? You have to ask the same question of yourself. You can get into a power trip. You can get into this thing where it's, it's all about you getting your way and, and forcing it and manipulating people. And it's not Christ-like at all. So I ask my question, you know, myself, am I a servant? And I start thinking, well, you know, I've done some things for some people, you know. But then how do I feel when somebody treats me like a servant? Dave, Dave, come here. What? Why don't you just get a dog whistle? Why are you treating me like that? Where'd that come from? It's because I forget I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I'm, I won't be offended by that. And by the way, when the Bible talks about being a servant, it's talking about being a slave. So why do I get all irritated when somebody shows me disrespect Hey, you, yeah, you, Pastor Dave, come here. You give me a ride home today. <laughs> I'm doing what? Why, did you consult my schedule or did you make this appointment with my wife? Because I need to know. Where'd that come from? I forget I'm a servant. I forget I'm a servant. And that attitude arises from a heart that does not wish to serve. So I'm confessing again, forgive me. Demetrius, in verse 12, has a good reputation from all and from the truth itself. We also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. So he says, listen, you got a problem in your church. you got this guy. And John just doesn't talk about the problem, but he talks about a solution. He goes, by the way, have you considered my servant Demetrius, who's a good guy? And i got a face for Demetrius, too. I think he's, a, you know, he's just that quiet, humble loving, you know, do right sort of guy. I, I, and anyway, I saw this online, so I put him, I don't know who he is, so I, he looks like a good guy, so I thought he was. But here's his testimony. His testimony is from everyone. Everyone says the same thing about this guy. Can you imagine that? Everyone says good about this guy. I haven't heard a bad thing from anybody about this guy. Everybody speaks well of him, of the truth itself, because the things that he actually does are good and right before God. It's not just that he's a favorite of the people, but he's a favorite of the people because he does the right thing, which means God approves of him. And number three, he says, I, John the Apostle, give my stamp of approval on this guy. It sounds like he's trying to make a swap. This guy, Demetrius, all full of himself, bing, get rid of this guy. Why don't you put him in place? He's a servant. He does well. He does the truth. Everybody likes him. And I think he's a great guy. You should put him in place of this other guy. That's what I think is going on. It's a little bit of a, he's doing a switch. The early church needed to be protected and preserved. And John, from afar, was actually trying to make sure that the things went that way. Because sometimes you can get into a political situation which becomes impossible to change. Have you ever had that impossible employee that the company just could never get rid of? Hopefully it wasn't you. 
but you get this impossible work and you go, why are they still working here? I can't believe it. They come in late, they leave early, they, they seem to always have an excuse for everything, they don't get their work done. Oh, you can't do your work? No problem. We'll have all these other people do your work for you. And you just sit there all day and gossip. Yeah, it's too personal. Okay. Yeah, there are things like that that happen in this world. I can tell you and I, I won't go any further. But the church itself needs to be protected and preserved. And so if you've got that thing going on, it's super important because it affects a lot of other people. Verse 13, in closing, I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. I hope to see you shortly, which is what he said in 2 John. And we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So in closing, he says, I hope to see you guys face to face instead of just pen and ink or instead of texting you or sending you an email or whatever. And he said this in 2 John as well. And so I thought I would add a couple of very savvy things, you know. The best form of communication. Yeah, I don't know that anybody's ever used that, but, you know. And... Uh, better than texting or email. <laughs> See you young people, I, I could do this mysteriously. <laughs> Actually, what it means is, uh, in the original language, it says, I, I look forward to seeing you mouth to mouth, which has a different connotation. But our phraseology would be face to face. Did you know that face to face conversation has been found to fight depression? which is why a lot of this COVID stuff is just crazy. Anyway, trivia, forgive me. Now you remember when Jesus calmed the storm and he was asleep in the boat and the disciples just before they went under for the third time woke him up as a last ditch effort to straighten things out. In the, in the middle of this letter that he writes about the atrophies and all of the, the hardship that's going on, he says, peace be to you after this letter. You see, John's not rocked by all this. He says, I have a plan of action. We're going to take care of this. In fact, here's another guy you might want to think about putting in his place. Uh, but when I come to, to you, I'm going to bring him into remembrance of these things. And so he's got a plan, but it doesn't upset his peace, you see. And so he's willing to give peace. And he says, listen, peace be to you. And I hope to see you guys shortly. It's the peace of God, even in the midst of the storm. And, you know, we can be in the middle of the most trying times of our world, and yet the peace of God can rule in your hearts because you know that God's in control. Just like Mark said, he's in control. He's sovereign among all these things, like the prophet Johnson said. Don't forget the Lord is in the same boat with you. And I think that's the problem of the disciples. They forgot that Jesus was in the boat with them. They thought they were all on their own and it had everything to do with their ability to get out of this mess. And it wasn't. It was really about the Lord in the boat. And they did the right thing by contacting him and waking him up. And then he, he spoke to the, the waves the way he would speak to an evil spirit. And they were instantly calm. And then Jesus looked at him. This is my own version. What's wrong with you? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why do you have such little faith? And they, they were amazed. They go, what, what kind of guy is this that speaks, speaks to the winds and the waves and they obey him? It's an amazing thing. We can do the same. And the last thing he says, he says, our friends greet you and greet the friends by name. It's interesting how we can find comfort with our friends in the middle of difficult times. And John actually brings this up. Not only do you have the peace of God, but you also have the support of other like-minded people who love the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Like these two <laughs> unusual people over here. Or maybe like, oh, I cut Randy's hat off. That's Randy behind Rocco. Anyway, don't forget your friends in times like this. And don't forget that the Lord's in the boat with you. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up.
this is one of those times in the service where you can think about those things that the Lord may have spoken to you today and make a decision what you're going to do about it. Make a decision about how your life can further conform to the image of Jesus Christ and the things that we've talked about going through 3 John. I pray that the Lord would prosper you and keep you in health even as your soul prospers. I wish that for all of you. In Jesus' name.